Um, but that's when we really kicked it in with the touring and all that stuff. Like we we had already been to uh, Rotterdam, Holland, and played a gigantic festival. It was like uh, I don't know, eighty thousand people. Really? Yeah. Was, what was that like, man? That was mind blowing. That was the <laughs> biggest crowd I've ever been in front of. But well, yeah, I would think. I mean, most anybody. The funny thing is, though, is like. The bigger the crowd, the easier it is to play. Really? Because you don't have that personal, there's no, nothing really. it's just a big mass that moves. It, it like nothing, you, you might see some faces in the first or second row or third row maybe. But after that, it's just like this just big sea of motion, you know. I mean, but so, does the adrenaline, like it, 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 just to be in front of that, you got to have like massive amounts of adrenaline oh, going yeah. through you. Like it's oh, got to yeah. be <laughs> unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Level Up Cleveland. And this week we have Mr. Jeff Finn. If anybody uh, wants to know who Jeff is, he was a part of a band named Dink back in the 90s. They were pretty big in the 90s. You guys are actually still relevant through the 2000s because you guys were releasing some stuff through there that you actually kind of recorded maybe back in the 90s also. But really, when you guys were in your heyday and you were really doing it, it was the 90s. Yeah. It was kind of that... that um, Sort of mid-90s. Yeah, right. And it was kind of like that whole rave scene that was going on. You guys were a part of that. You guys were a part of the whole industrial rock, the whole, um, I, I, I've heard it called like alternative industrial hard rock, because it's a lot of fusion, a lot of different things that are going on. But it's definitely not like that traditional band where you just have your drummer, bass player, guitar player, singer. No. You guys had to like, there's like sampling, a lot of sampling that goes on in there. There's mm -hmm. some rapping that went on in, the, in that kind of, you know, stuff. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of different things you guys were throwing out there. But for, for the most part, it, the whole music was really made for dancing all night long, that kind of thing. It was a, it was a whole... It was just a whole scene, a whole vibe that was all included. Would that, would that be pretty accurate? Well, we liked to. We were hard enough for the guys and dancey enough for the girls. It was like, that's the way I like to think of it. I mean, it was a healthy mix of a whole bunch of different genres of music, but it had a groove to it. So did you guys have to, like, was it, was it one of those situations where each guy in the band had his own thing and that that's how it fused, or... Were you guys, did you guys have to like really plan some of this stuff out and stuff? Because there's a lot going on in these songs. This isn't, this isn't typical stuff. There's so much going on. It would seem like there has to be a lot of like planning. Yeah. Well, we're tied to a track for one thing, you know, so like it's like, you know, push play, don't make any mistakes kind of deal. Um, so with that in the background, you know, everybody brought their own influence to the scene, you know. Eddie, so is that what it was? You guys had a track to start it with? Yeah. They, that... the, the guys, um, early on, Jer and Rob and Sean would get together in this little basement of his farmhouse, and um, he had put together these sparse tracks with like a you know sparse keyboard bass line and drum machines and stuff like that and like he started creating these what the, the bare bones of what would become dink i guess and uh once he got a little i don't know a little bit of feedback from that stuff he wanted to do it live so that's where uh, Eddie and I came in. So, so he was, was he making like, so the creating tracks? Is that what you're saying though? Like was, so yes. it was like electronic drum beats and stuff like that. Yes. Loops. They were already start. That was back when the loops were kind of starting off basically. Right. I mean, so, yeah. so that's what he was doing, basically creating that. And then you guys would just pile on. Yeah. Eventually, like when he decided he wanted to go live with it, um, he hired Ed and I, and, uh, that's when, we started 
uh, first practicing the stuff to see if it would work. And uh, that was an experience in itself because we had this uh, warehouse in Akron that was also like a novelty company, like with fake tombstones and like Halloween stuff. Oh, cool, yeah. And stuff. And then some uh, guy's car collection was in there too. But uh, we practiced in there. And that... We practiced... Okay, this was the way we started this. We knew we were going to play with strobe lights. So we wanted to get used to it. So we practiced in full darkness with just strobe lights. And (laughs) And this was early on you did this? Yeah, this is the beginning. And uh, we practiced usually... Um, about t- 20 hours a week, you know, five hours a, a night, four nights a week. Wow. And, uh, just to get used to all this crazy lights and stuff. What made you, what made you decide that though? How did you guys decide what you were going to do already? Like ahead of time? What was, how, how did Sean sort of had a, a vision type a thing vision of what he wanted to do, you know, got a booty full of head. We squatted at a, at a rehearsal space that was Indian Rope Burns, uh, that was a band at camp at the time. And it was at 750 East Talmadge Avenue. In the, like the basement of a novelty store in East Akron. And they could be as loud as they wanted all night long. We got a key and never paid rent and left like 3,000 beer bottles. Rob and I got off at work at 8 o'clock at Woodsy's. We go home for an hour and I had a van and we'd round up everybody um, and get them in the van and we'd be there by 10 or 10.30. We were there four or five nights a week. Five nights a week, four hours a night. You played to the songs four or five times every night. We just kept rehearsing and putting parts together because it was part oriented. Sean kind of was like the ringleader in terms of like, you know, keeping things moving into practice. Do it freaking again and play your fucking part. He wanted to be different and uh, I think we achieved that a little bit. <laughs> now, know? when you say Sean, I, I, you know, I'm going to go through real quick the guys in the band so we, so we can acknowledge who each guy was that okay. was in the band. I think I, got it. I think I got it right here. Okay. So Sean is Sean Carlin. Yes. And he was lead vocals. He was, no, a gu- he was, he was the programmer and a guitar player. So he didn't do vocals? Uh, he did on a couple tracks, but oh. he wasn't. But his main thing, main thing was programmer, and then he was a guitar player also. Right. And he had two. He had, he had many guitar players. Y'all played guitar kind of sort of, except for the drummer, right? And 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 you played bass, right? But did you? Okay, we get to that. We also had uh, Rob Lightbody. Yep. He was the lead vocalist. Yes, and he also played guitar. Yes, and you had Jer Herring. Yes, and he was another guitar player, and he also did backup vocals. He was also a lead vocalist. Oh, he did leads they, too. They, they traded leads all the oh, time on oh, different oh, oh. songs. And when Jer was singing, Rob was playing guitar and vice versa. Oh. And why would they change? Like, what would be the, was it just say different styles and one style fit better for that part of the song? Is that how they would do it? Or did one guy write that part? And so well, he, he's... they had two distinctly different approaches. Uh, Jer was more... Um, I don't want to say rap oriented, but like just uh, groovy, very, almost like kind of like very rhymy and and groovy. And uh, Rob was more uh, on the harder edge with the screaming and oh, okay, like stuff like that, you know. So, so they had they had distinctive styles that kind of led to where they would fit in, right? I got you. So you also had uh, Jeff Finn, which we were, we were sitting here talking to you now and played bass. You didn't do any vocals? Um, a couple backups, but not usually. Just no. like maybe some gangs and stuff like that when they were required? Yeah. And this, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to butcher this. Jean-Eddie Van Der Kill? Jean-Eddie Van Der Kill. He's a, he lives right up here in Lakewood. Really? Yeah. And he played drums for you guys. Yeah. Now, now, how did, yeah. now, how does that work? Did you guys also have a drum track playing, and then he would also play drums, and everything would kind of like... Yes. We always had track, but it, like we even had a, a, a sparse... Everything was sparse, though. The, the, the drums and the keyboard bass line were just very, like, almost like a bop, 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 kind of thing. I got you. More like a droning yeah, type. Know? Yeah. And we would come and, you know, just do our live thing over top of it, you know, and 
try to have a healthy balance of the mix and all that. Cool, cool, cool. So you guys, 1992, that's about the time you guys got together and this whole thing kind of started back at that point. And then how long yeah, did, did it take for you guys to kind of like form this thing before it really started to like blossom? Well, I think as far as I can remember, the record came out in 95, I believe. Yeah, I believe you're right. And, uh, you know, we'd been doing a lot before that as well. Um, but that's when we really kicked it in with the touring and all that stuff. Like we, we had already been to, uh, Rotterdam, Holland and played a gigantic festival. It was like, uh, I don't know, 80,000 people. Really? Yeah. Was, what was that like, man? That was mind blowing. That was the <laughs> biggest crowd I've ever been in front of. But well, yeah, I would think, I mean, most anybody. The funny thing is, though, is like the bigger the crowd, the easier it is to play. Really? Because you don't have that personal, there's no, nothing really. It's just a big mass that moves. It, it like nothing. You, you might see some faces in the first or second row or third row, maybe. But after that, it's just like this just big sea of motion, you know? I mean, but so, does the adrenaline, like, it, it, just to be in front of that, you got to have like massive amounts of adrenaline oh, going yeah. through you. Like, it's oh, got to yeah. be <laughs> unbelievable. Unbelievable, and and the fact that you're so far removed from home too at this point, all that's all that's got to play a part in this whole thing, also, right? Well, see, with this festival, we had a a trailer. Everybody had trailers. These beautiful yellow little like they almost looked like stagecoaches, but really? they were they were trailers. And we went into our trailer, and there's like you know. Uh, the biggest bottle of Jägermeister I've ever seen. Nice. And like, you know, our, a fridge full of Guinness. And, and it was probably the real Jäger, right? That wasn't the Americanized Jäger. That no, had the, no, no, no. That had the uh, opium in it, this right? Didn't they have opium in it? I don't know. It's just <laughs> I like think they did. the big bottle, you know. It's like not, not like the rectangular bottles we have here. It was sort of round, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, so you guys, they they provided each band with their own trailer. And how many bands do you think are on this on this bill? Like a lot of bands. There's there like uh, yeah, like it, more than twenty. Uh, I would say at least twenty. And how did you get yeah. invited to this? Did you guys did you guys get yourselves on this bill, or did they ask you to come I, on? Do you remember? Somehow, uh, I believe one of Jan Eddie's friends set it up. Oh no, kidding! Because this is before we were really, you know, I, I think it's before we were signed even. You know, we just did this on our own. We have a, a friend, um, Steve Gang, who is, uh, he's you know, he was with us for a long time. And we had a studio up there at his place and stuff. And he had some money, so he uh, offered to pay for the plane ride over there and footed the whole bill for the whole festival. No thing. kidding. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. So when you guys find out that you're gonna go do this, what's that like? Like what? What? Like how does that happen? Where we're like oh, it freaked me out. Uh, yeah, man. <laughs> because you guys haven't even really done anything yet. Really, I mean, you've done it, but you haven't like well, made any kind of a splash yet, right? right? You right. know, like how does this we, happen? Well, it's like we we had played one gig. We had played one gig at our friend's little do-it-yourself venue. It was called the Manus, and now it's uh. A bar, Bar Lucci, it's going to be a venue again. Um, but we had played one gig there, and it was an invite-only gig. We had practiced our asses off for like, I don't know, like a year straight and not played any shows, not caved to any of the people that wanted us to play. Um, we just kept plugging away at it. We finally played this one show. It was private, and it was just insane like packed, completely overpacked, like like and, like just people the, like the yeah. well, the whole place just kind of moves back and forth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and yeah you, I've seen those. Got to be careful not to step on a bottle or something, you know. Yeah, right. But uh, after that, word just like spread, and uh, actually, a guy from uh, Capitol Records was there to check us out somehow he had heard about it and uh at the end he was like you know i, I don't quite get what you guys are doing but uh it 
seems like it's good. Yeah, obviously there's <laughs> you know? enough people here to t- tell me that I'm I might not know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so so then Capital, you get signed with Capital Records. Yeah. That's another pretty amazing point, right? I mean, like these are all little points that quickly happening a lot in a, in a short amount of time. It's not like over a ten year span. This is a couple years. All this is yeah, happening. Yeah, over, it was know? like it was like we did that show at the Manus, and then word spread, and and uh, record companies started sniffing around, and uh, we we're trying to you know see what we wanted to do deal wise, and then we got we did that Holland thing. And word spread about that, and well, that kind of legitimizes that. That gives you like le- legitimacy, where you know it's one thing to be a great band and sound good and all that stuff, but when you can say, or when people can say, yeah, and they played in front of eighty thousand people in Holland, it now the perspective of you's changed in, in people's minds. They're like, oh, maybe I should check yeah. them out. They're legitimate. Right? Yeah. Isn't that how it kind of I happens? Guess, I mean. It does. It, it, I think it does. I think that's why, you know, like when we do this show, one thing about this show is that we do all these local guys, and we find out that some of these local musicians are just phenomenal, amazing. Oh, yeah. and, and and then you see the people who have made it nationally, and you wonder how did they make it nationally, and how does this person not? And I think it it's all about timing and breaks, and, and, sure. and, be, and, and something like that happens for you, and it changes the perspective of your band. You know what I mean? Now you're legitimate. Now you're up there playing in front of 80,000 people. It just changes the way people look at you, I think. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then they hear about yeah. you, and then other people want to know more, and you get blah, blah, blah. It just, it just grows from there, right? Well, and quickly. It's like, and, and, I mean, after that, it was just like, uh, this is exactly what I want to do, like, constantly. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, screw this, like, 80 people. <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah. You know? <laughs> You're ready for the. You're ready for eighty thousand a gig. Thanks for coming out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's cool, man. That's cool. Um, So then, you guys did more stuff though. That you know, like, didn't you guys do other stuff too, like more festivals and stuff like that? Because yeah, yeah. Because what happens is, is like you guys are in the middle of like a. a, a, This was a, a moment in where this music was big. You know, there's always like these little windows of time throughout the history of music. And this was it, man. You got and you guys were like right in the prime of everything. This well, it's it seems to me it's like when I think about those years, it's like that was the golden era because that was when like it didn't matter really what your band sounded like. Everybody got a break. They were signing bands like Mad and so many good ones. And then all of a sudden the record companies were like, okay, well, we need a band that sounds like this, a band that sounds like that, a band that sounds like that. And that's when it started getting weird. But, but in the, you know, the early to mid nineties, my God, there were just so many great bands and they were all being played like on the end in Cleveland and yeah, stuff. Right. And, you know, and, you know, we got to play with a lot of those guys, like, you know, so so this was in the beginning this was like Sean's vision right that's what you're saying basically and then it kind of grew out of that we to- we totally intended on we we wanted to make it we we really so really you had a, you almost like a formulated type of plan it's like this is the plan to, to get where we want to go yep. so what so so he kind of he kind of like starts all this then and then in his mind and you guys are all kind of like on board with it and everything so the record company signs you guys do they now? start to try to infiltrate into what you guys are doing and try to say, Hey, try a little bit more of this. Or are they, are they now trying to influence what you guys are doing more because now they've invested money into you and they want to say so a little bit more. Is that happening now? Sometimes like when the first record came out, they just, you know, they just backed us totally with touring, you know, because they wanted us to support the record and all that. And, uh, you know, but when it when it came time for the second record, then they were a little more, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say judgmental, but they had a little more input on what they were expecting. And, uh, yeah, we sort of weren't ready to play ball with that yet. Yeah. So so the first <laughs> album you guys put out was your self-titled one. It was Dink, right? So that, that it's Dink, Dink, basically is what it was. It's right. the first one. And you guys, that was enough to basically tour on that one album right right did you guys just play the whole album when you played out and more 
what's the end more? Was that like new stuff that you guys were in the middle of making, or did you no, guys? No, no, just the st- we had a whole. We had like I don't know three or four different sets that oh. we could play, and the stuff that made it onto the record. I mean, there was still at least maybe two more records worth of stuff that we would filter through, you know, depending on how we felt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that I mean, it wasn't just play the record. It was like. You had a gig set up. You yeah. guys already had had planned that also. So you guys were like really methodical. I mean, would that be would that be fair to say? Very oh, yeah. methodical about everything you did. Oh yeah. Could you have done this without being that way? Do you think you couldn't just wing this the type of type of thing? Well, could you? Probably not, because I mean, especially like being tied to the track. Um, you know, it sounds bad, but it's not. It's it's just like there's no room for real error, and can't get off the tr- because we were using dat machines back then and i mean it was basically just hit play and we would hear the click and show starts you and, knew what to do right then and we didn't we didn't stop until it was over you know and uh yeah this music wasn't like play have, a song have a, a break play a song have a break right. these songs would just bleed one right into the other right right just not stop like we would leave leave room and some ambience in there for whatever but we knew the cues to start the songs you know right right it was it wasn't a whole lot of you know talking to the crowd or anything like that just occasionally just hey how you doing that kind of thing and you guys really couldn't afford to have breakdowns either right like things had to go no, right like no, everything had to no. work and operate and blah blah, no. blah blah like Sean and I were constantly I mean you couldn't really tell on stage but we were constantly sort of like looking at each other and counting in our heads like when the break was coming up and if ed the drummer sometimes he would he would not be with what was going on and counting back you know wrong or something and sean and i would it would sound like ed's going to go into the the breakdown and sean and i'd be like nope (laughs) nope nope yes and then we would just like blast in, and then Ed would figure it out. You oh, know? I see. But but as long as Sean and I were on, you know, cue with the the track, like it, everybody know, else could just, seem to follow that whole. Right. That would be the good enough. Right. That's cool. So the, the one thing about like these raves back then at that time um, was that there was a lot of drugs at these at these parties. Man, was, these were these were like big uh, designer drug. This was like when the designer drugs were getting popular in the in the early nineties. Really? I didn't see any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you had the ecstasy and the mollies and all that stuff was coming out. It was getting big. Mostly ecstasy at that time it was pretty was pretty popular at those rates and stuff. And that was the whole part. That was the that was part of the fuel as far as the all night parties and the all night music thing. But you know, I I, I was I, I I went to a couple raves and I heard a lot about them. They sometimes they were crazy. It's crazy stuff would happen at these things as a result of all that. Kids with the plastic see-through backpacks with the teddy bears and the alley pops in and that kind of shit. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on at these things. How, how crazy did it get? I mean, like, like, do you remember, like, some really, really, really crazy stuff where you were like, how the hell am I getting, like, why, I, I gotta get the hell out of here, or like, just, you ever scared at, at any moment where you're like, oh boy, did it ever escalate like that? I mean, I, I didn't like I partied my ass off, obviously, but I didn't really ever get to the point where, like, like I didn't do any of that. The the I, you know, I, it wasn't for I, you that doing that crazy. No, the, 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 like, the, some of the designer ones. I wasn't into the trip scene. I wasn't into the any of that stuff. You know, like back in my early days, you know, I experimented with stuff like that. Like before I was even in a band and all that, but. I don't know. My thing was mostly just weed. Yeah, you know, but, that, but it was all around you. I mean, like you guys are playing, and, oh, yeah. and it, it, it's everywhere. And you know, a lot of those rays were just like you described with that other, where it's just so packed with people. You know, well, a I lot mean, of crazy stuff can happen. Our our singer Rob used to get have some fun with that kind of stuff. He would, uh, I mean, one time I think it was in like maybe Dallas or something. He took off after the show with a bunch of chicks and uh, apparently did a bunch of acid. And uh, I don't know what the deal was, but uh, there was some incident at a gas station where 
the girl opened up her glove box and there was a gun in it and Rob was tripping and he freaked out and he got out in the middle of fucking God knows where <laughs> and just started running. <laughs> and uh, eventually, after a while, he flagged down a cop. <laughs> and like his cop asked him what he was doing he's like man i'm in this rock band we're staying at this hotel i don't know where i am i don't know what's going on i gotta get back there the bus is gonna leave so like we're we're seriously getting ready to leave and this cop shows up with rob because is this yours <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so you guys had given up like at that point you guys would look for him couldn't find him is that we, what happened we were ready to leave we were going to give him a few more minutes and like we were ready to head to the next gig yeah and i mean that's the way those buses work yeah know? right it's hopefully like he finds yeah hopefully if you're not on it man you're tough shit yeah 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 man but uh anyway he gets on the bus and like he's got like his hoodie pulled up and, like it looks like Kenny from South Park. He's like, like you know, all like shriveled up. And like every time we look back at him, we just hear these little like animal like moans. Like, <laughs> <laughs> are you guys like making fun of him kind of this time? Like, like, I man, I'm glad you made it, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, we were getting ready to leave with us. <laughs> all right, man. We're gonna take a quick break, real quick. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more with Jeff about uh, the days with Dink after this. <laughs> Hello Cleveland, I am ZM Delgado, author of the Rust Belt Rock Review at ZachoLantern.com. And this is your weekend concert calendar update. First off, Thursday the 16th at no class, it's Stress Angel with support from Century, Vial Light, and Goat Chamber. Up next, Friday the 17th at the Buzz Bend, it's Pathos and Logos with Night Goat and Orion Sword. Next, Saturday the 18th at Vortex, Trephine, Samara, Behest of Serpents, Broodmonger, and Druparia. And finally, Sunday the 19th at no class, we've got Go Rod, Cognitive, Summoning the Lich, and Flub. So there you have it, Cleveland. We've got four shows coming up in one weekend. I hope that I catch you out there at least one of them. Until next time, rock on, Rust Belt. Hi, everybody. It's DJ Terry from the Homegrown Hit Show on 216 Beat Radio with your list of rockin' events for the week. Starting on Friday, March 17th, we've got Fallout, and they're at Kelly's in Cleveland. And we've got Brian Allen Hager, and he's at the Fox Meadow Country Club in Medina. And finally, we've got Macon's Rock, and they're at McKeevy's Pub out in Millersburg, Ohio. But whatever you do, get out there, keep supporting local music, and keep rocking with me on Monday nights. This is DJ Terry, and I'm out. And we are back with Mr. Jeff Finn from the band Dink. And what uh, one of the things I wanted to go over, too, was <clears throat> after you guys released that first album, uh, you guys put out a, a, a single called Green Mind. And that song actually became pretty successful. It was pretty, it was basically a hit for you guys. I mean, it was on the, it charted it, on, on certain charts. I mean, it wasn't just like on the top 40 chart, but it was a pretty popular song. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean... It, it, it got up there in, uh, I think, Alternative Press and I think Rolling Stone and I think one other one, too. Yeah. But uh, we got it in a couple movies, you know? Yeah, it was we, uh, like a f movie Fear yeah. and Double Dragon. Yeah. Those two movies that song appeared in. You, you, had yep. some, you had some other songs that appeared in other movies also, too. It wasn't just that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Angels was in uh, Bad Boys. Yeah, 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 yeah. A big, a big yeah. movie. I mean, not even, not yeah. even a low budget movie. Well, movie. the cool thing is, it's like the, like, I don't know how it worked out, but we got the coolest scenes, and like, 
the the coolest play it wasn't just like something real soft in the background it was like you know like in bad boys our song starts in uh club hell which kmfdm is playing when they walk in and uh in the bathroom a fight ensues and uh, our song starts playing you know and in fear the whole opening club scene thing you know that that they keep chopping it up but it's like that's Back in, yeah right yeah it's but it's a huge part of the movie you know yeah right man. so i don't know how that worked out but that's cool. Well, you guys obviously had a vibe that, that was these these uh, directors and producers thought fit these parts, man. The energy, right? It was like you were, you were matching these energies to what they had. So then you're with Capitol Records still, and you and, and you're now you were saying you're going to go do and you're going to do another album, and you were saying that they they were having a little more input at this point. They're trying to kind of influence themselves into what, what take you down some directions and stuff, and you guys didn't really respond too well with to, to that kind of thing no, was, i think they, they wanted more of a like i don't know sort of a replica of the other record oh and we were sean wanted to go a little harder with more guitar oriented and a little less of the machine stuff just to see how that would work more of a uh, a real a band a, a rock band more so than yeah. the electronic stuff yeah yeah so uh we put out i don't know maybe i think we recorded about 30 songs and uh we had uh an idea you know we we called it get off my rocket and we picked the songs for that one but uh they weren't ready to put that out yet. So they did this uh, thing called Blame It on Tito that was an EP that had some of those songs on there. But it wasn't at all like, you know, it was, it's a good EP. It's just, it, it's not what we would have had on the record if we wanted to, you know. So, so in other words, if you had full control, full say-so, it would have been a different different thing so right. they they did it actually end up getting some of their influence on to what you guys were putting out right it, okay now the thing was did that ever actually get released like that at that point so you guys you guys record this album but did, did it ever really no not? no tito tito got released but that was it that was i think that was the last one and uh but it did get released it but it did get released in like 2012, I believe is what it was. That when it was, or, or, or two thousand in the 2000s, it actually did get put out. Did it not? The music, the new record, yes, no. Oh, it never did. No. Oh, so this music's just and sitting some, there. Some, some, some of that is on that uh, oh. documentary, and uh, yeah, I it, like I had the like master cassette tapes, so I had them. Uh, transferred to CD and copied them. So I have like the whole catalog, so to speak, whole, uh, yeah. of uh, of songs. And these yeah. are songs that were recorded in the studio. These are like these aren't like demos. No, no, they're they're it, like completely the, done. So somebody could you could really like release had, this as a we work. Had, we had uh, like uh, Paul Coldery worked on. Um, a lot of it and uh, we just had a lot of uh, hours in the studio recording this stuff so um, yeah it, uh, everybody still has it but it's just not been released you know but uh, we I mean, any plans to do it any plans to release this stuff well I think if you go to our website the uh, official dink dot com um i think there there's a bunch of it on there oh okay so there, you, there is access to it all it's just not yeah. been like an official right. release under this title that right. kind of thing type stuff okay yeah. that's cool that's cool yeah 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 so okay so then you guys did some more uh, uh, any any other shows or festivals or anything big you want to talk about or anything like that where it was like uh, uh, was that the biggest one would that be the biggest one that you did the one that was in holland 
eighty thousand. Did you guys ever do anything anything close like that again? No, we, but we, I mean, we played like basically every mid-sized famous venue in the country. You know that kind oh, yeah. of that kind of thing. It's you guys like, did tour the whole country though. You guys like, made it around. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like I mean, obviously not Alaska or Hawaii. But the other forty-eight, every, you guys everywhere else. Really, no kidding. Yeah. Were you guys doing this now with other headliners, or yeah. okay? Yeah. So you were just getting on bigger bills. Well, we we did some on our own. Like those were the the van tours, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would, we would do those on our own, and then um, we did. You know, we we were with uh, Popoli itself. Uh, Lords of Acid, KMFDM. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, just like some of the bigger ones that were doing the same some type thing that you guys were doing, but there were some of the bigger names yeah, at the time. I mean, we played with like Thrill Kill Cult. Or, oh no, kidding. Um, all kinds of bands, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cool. Wow. But but I mean, there were there were cool festivals also. Like we did this Mud Fest thing, or at least that's what I call it. It was. I I like I, I want to say like Wisconsin or something, but uh, the whole field was just like it had rained the night before, so the whole field was just like <coughs> a big mud pit. Oh yeah, like that Woodstock and, show though. That one, yeah, and, and they were throwing mud up on the stage too, so people with squeegees like you know getting the mud off the stage. And I mean, this was a big deal too, like. The Ramones were playing, um, Monster Magnet, uh, oh my god, just, I forget, there were like 40 tour buses out, out, no in, the back, kidding. out in the back of the place, and, uh, KMFDM wasn't playing the gig that day, so we decided we would, and, uh, it was it was a great time. It was like like I mean, it was just amazing. And the guys from KMFDM are out there with squeegees helping get the mud off the stage for us and stuff. But uh, but you have to have your own guys squeegeeing it out there, or do you guys have guys, or did they have guys like stagehands and stuff like no, that? No, it was the K- or, it was the, like the actual KMFDM people were like <laughs> they're out were, there were, and the band was doing. Yeah, it. that's awesome, man. Um, so. What after Dink's over, you guys eventually break up in the way. What 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 ends what ends Dink? To be honest, let's just go start real quick. How how does it end? Is it just kind of like flame out, or is there a a moment where it's like this is it? Well, we we did a, a ill fated show in New York, and uh, I don't know. It didn't go over well, and our rep took us out to. A real fancy steak dinner with a you know place where the cows are all like hung up in the windows. Shit. <laughs> oh yeah, and uh, he sort of laid it on us like uh, you know I think this is it, guys. You know, really? <laughs> so because like I guess EMI, the parent company, was downsizing, oh. and uh, we didn't make the 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 cut of how many records you had to sell to stay on. Oh, I yeah. see. I see. So you, you were dropped by the rocker company is what happened. And that, and that, that started the whole entire process for the whole ding thing to kind of just kind of like call it quits at that point. Yeah. I mean, there were, there, there were a lot, like, there's a lot that led up to that, you know, like it's all kind of a, explained in that documentary but, oh yeah let's talk about that because that's what but, it, but but anyway it's like we fired i didn't really want to but the rest of the guys i guess did um we fired like the best manager we ever had after that it just went oh really because she was very well liked by our record company and easy to work with and to this day, I think that's the biggest mistake we ever made. Oh, really? And then, I see. And then the next thing, you know, like, we had a slew of other managers, none of whom were cool. And uh, that's how our singer ended up getting fired. 
Oh. And, and and that really put the nail in the coffin. Oh. So this was just like and one small event and one small event, one small, and then it just turned into like this is just too it much. Just, to yeah, it just I don't know. It was just yeah. got stupid kind of after a while, right? Got, yeah, just, just got, good, just, it got really. That's a good way to put it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what it's. Uh, it happens though. I mean that's not it's not uncommon. You know that's why that's why it's so amazing when you hear a band's been together for thirty fucking years or some crazy amount. It's like how do you get through all this crazy stuff that every band they, has to go through? They must be banking. Yeah, right. It's, <laughs> you, you, you bite your lip, I guess, in, in some of those. Um, so yeah, so then eventually someone gets the idea to create a documentary and document this entire this entire thing that you guys did that's, that's known as Dink, and a, and a documentary is made called Gangrene. Yeah, and I, tell me who made it and how does that, how does that all come about? Well, it was, it's Jorge, Jorge De La Rosa and his company Slow Mutants, but I think he he got the I think he got the idea to do it because it was his like final uh, film school project or something or his ma- oh. master's something i don't know <laughs> but he uh he did that for his final it was a school project right? for oh yeah. no kidding man. yeah wow so so is this all footage that you guys had had you guys documented a lot of things throughout this whole process with with video footage and stuff that he was able to access and that's how he kind of put a lot of this stuff together yeah, plus yeah. interviews Every, and stuff like that everybody sort of contributed i mean you know some people had some you know Old tapes here, old tapes there, photographs. Uh, just enough to make a whole documentary, basically. Is and then and like I said, I've seen little bits and pieces of it, but it's like, um, it's a it's, it's a it's a really well done documentary, though. It's a, it doesn't look very, you know, some of these can be real cheesy, especially yeah. now with the age of YouTube, where everyone makes a documentary. Like <laughs> some of them are terrible, you know. And I mean, you watch and you're like, oh, it shouldn't even. But this one looks very well done. Oh know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, he, and he's the real deal. He he does good stuff. The pro- the thing is though is like this isn't something that you can just access as easily. It's like it's not it's not on Netflix. It's not on Hulu or any of those type of things right there where you can just go watch it. Um, but we were talking before. There are ways to get copies of it. Yeah. Right? I mean, you can you can access copies of it and stuff like that, and we'll put that information up. I'll put it up there for people to, so they can, if they ever want to get a copy of it, they can. Cool. Um, but yeah, very well done. I, I really would like to get. I, what I'd like to see is uh, people have better access to it so that pe- more people can watch it. Because I, I, you know, like obviously, dude, if there's a lot of people showing up at these gigs, you know, there's a lot of people that are remember Dink. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people that, you know were a part of that whole scene at that time and would be interested in a lot of this stuff. I believe, you know what I mean? I think that would, sure. that would be cool. So what do you do now? What, 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 what do you, what do you, what do you, uh, you still doing music? Or are you, are you, I work with the, uh, Woodsy's, uh, sound and music production, uh, setting up shows for other people, you know, putting backline together. Uh, so basically what does that mean? Like backline? So you, you, like like these bands come to town instead of bringing semis full of equipment, they they give you they tell you what they need and then you bring the equipment to the show for them and set yeah. it up and everything. Yeah, I just I mean, I go from their rider and a list and just put together exactly what they need and uh, set it up sometimes and uh, you know have to babysit it. Does that does that when you say exactly what they need, does that even include like amplifiers and stuff like that also? I mean, does oh that, yeah. So you got to have like a, a Every, massive everything. inventory. Everything. Massive inventory. Yeah. Because there's there's so many different things that. I yeah. mean, there's so yeah. many. Yeah, we have we have pretty much everything. No kidding. <laughs> okay, and this is what you do for a living. This is what you do. Yeah. Wow, and what kind of circuit are you running? Like like work and like where would where would people recognize your work? Like, especially, you're basically local. I mean, right? Is it mostly yeah. local? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, theaters, like, you know, Goodyear, Robbins, Civic. Um, Out toward the Akron area a lot? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you're doing so, a lot of that stuff. Lighting, sound, 
and then yeah. create and providing whatever they need. Yeah. Now, do you ever run sound? Not really. I mean, I'm I'm learning. I set. I mean, I set up PAs. I build. I build the system, and cable the system. And you're just not mixing on the fly while those. Work. Yeah, yeah. I, that's my next project. Really, that's what you're <laughs> looking to get into. Yeah. So you guys, you still get along with everybody in the band? Like, like, like after all this happens, a lot of times you know there's some fallout and stuff. But it sounds like you you still stay in touch with everybody and everyone. Everything's kind of on the up and up still. Cool. Yeah, yeah. We went through our our period, I guess, where we didn't talk to each other. Oh. But uh, then I don't know, like Sean and I was talking to Sean because I was down at this this. Uh, fancy beer wine place and they had just got a gotten a broken window and sean was the one that was putting the new window in so i ran into him down there and then while i was talking to him ed called and he was like man this is weird do you guys want to like just play together again so we started a different band oh uh, so that was called kind um and you know, we just just locally played around locally, just know. for a little while. Yeah, were you guys doing covers at the time, or are you guys doing your uh, original stuff? We did original stuff, but we did uh, a couple, you know, a couple of Dink songs. Oh no, kid! Just with no machine, just stripping it all down and kind of doing it a different way. Yeah, was that fun? Good yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, we got a good reception, I guess. Do you guys ever think about doing that, or do you ever talk about doing it again? No. That's it. Dink Dink's done. Yeah. That's it. The end of that. That era is no, over. No, it's, it's like, okay, I mean, yeah, stuff I kept in touch with him, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, Jer, I keep in touch with him through the, you know, just whatever on the web. And then, uh, like I said, Ed lives up here in Lakewood. And uh, Sean is uh, in Hudson, like, you know, maybe... 15 minutes away from me and rob um he lives right down the street but for some reason like that's the one you see the least yeah <laughs> it's that weird like that <laughs> all right man well i appreciate you coming down man that was cool this has been really cool and and hopefully some of the people who have we answered some questions if anybody had any questions about what happened or what how it went and stuff but it's very interesting stuff man you're very cool get it <laughs> You had a pretty cool little stint there of stuff. I'm, I'm old, man. My memory, you know. Yeah. No, no. It's really cool, though. I mean, like I said, it's very cool to hear somebody who's actually seen and done some of the stuff you've done. Playing in front of 80,000 people has got to be the coolest. You know, that's just that's something that you, you can't ever forget, right? Yeah, but, I mean, it, and also, you know, we played, like, famous, like, CBGB, the whiskey. Oh, you did all um, those, too. All that stuff. God. You know, it's just... We played, Living a dream almost. We, like we played the the place in Texas, I think it was, where the Sex Pistols played with that notorious, where Stiv hit the guy in the head with the bass. Oh, you were the oh, no kidding, man. Yeah, like, that's we awesome. Played that place. All kinds of crazy shit. Cool, man. It is. It's, 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 like I said, this is it's, it's it's cool to hear the success stories, but not just that, the fun. You know, the fun, because really that's what this ended up being more about. was uh, like, have, you've had a lot of fun, and a lot of fun, man. Crazy have, type of fun that you can't get anywhere else. We had more fun than anybody should ever be allowed to have. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man, that's it. We're going to we're gonna call, call it right there. We're all out of time, but uh, I want to thank you again for coming down. I really uh, I appreciate it, man. Cool, it's been thanks. cool, uh, and I hope everybody got out, out of this what uh, we hope they got out of it. Check out the documentary if you can. Um, I'm going to put up a link up here to so you can get in. Get a copy of it if you guys want to check it out. Till now, though, that's it. We're out. We'll see you guys next week. That'll be fine.